Hello and welcome to a special edition of World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program. Fifteen years ago, the U.S.-led coalition of the willing let loose shock and all on Iraq on a mission to topple Saddam Hussein and get rid of his so-called weapons of mass destruction. Those WMDs were never found. What else do we know now that we didn't know before and during the war? What's the long-term impact of the attack on the Middle East and how did the conflict affect the conduct of world affairs? I'm glad to be joined by two colleagues from different parts of the world, Asya Namdar from Washington, D.C., and Jack Barton from Baghdad. This is the special edition of World Insight on the 15th anniversary of the Iraq War. Fifteen years ago, a U.S.-led coalition brought an end to the rule of Saddam Hussein here in Iraq. An assumption that he possessed weapons of mass destruction turned out to be wrong. By then, it was too late to stop a sectarian insurgency followed by the rise of extremist groups like ISIL. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis were killed or injured in the crossfire. So what now for Iraq and its people? Join us on CGTN as we examine the aftermath of the Iraq war. The Iraq war 15 years on. A decade and a half ago, the United States and Britain invaded Iraq without UN authorization to oust Saddam Hussein. Their claims that Iraq was hiding weapons of mass destruction proved to be false. The invasion and years of occupation tore the country apart, leaving hundreds of thousands of people dead. CGT and Jack Barton reports from Baghdad on how and what was pitched as a short war led to a very long conflict. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict. Saddam refused to leave. First came the so-called shock and awe airstrikes. Then the U.S. military pushed into Iraq, backed by Poland, Australia and Britain. Tonight, British servicemen and women are engaged from air, land and sea. Their mission? to remove Saddam Hussein from power and disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. After an intense manhunt, Saddam was captured, put on trial and executed. But there was a problem. There were no weapons of mass destruction. Despite this, many Iraqis did initially welcome the U.S. troops. The wish for change was a dream for Iraqis, therefore toppling the former regime was not a mistake. What happened after the ex-regime fell was that we failed to provide a good example with our politics. Shiite Muslims who had been marginalized under Saddam found new freedom. Sunnis who had been favored by Saddam suddenly found themselves out of work and often persecuted. The disbanded, largely Sunni army morphed into an insurgency while Shiite leaders founded militias. They targeted each other, the coalition forces, but mostly civilians. Hundreds of thousands died. The U.S. military also became embroiled in a series of controversies, including the treatment of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison. Out of the chaos arose extremist groups like Al-Qaeda in Iraq and ultimately ISIL, which managed to easily overrun predominantly Sunni areas, many of which had complained of persecution since the fall of Saddam. ISIL has now been defeated and the guns are largely silent. The final verdict might be that the fall of Saddam Hussein and the occupation of Iraq brought some good but also an unimaginable degree of suffering to a nation that is only just beginning to recover from a decade and a half of bloodshed. Now our correspondent Jack Barton joined me live from Baghdad. Jack, welcome to the program. Fifteen years passed and now 
What challenges do the Iraqis say they're still facing? You are in Baghdad. Tell us more about that. And also, tell us more about the situation in Iraq, especially after the withdrawal of the U.S. forces in 2011. Jack. Well, the situation now is relatively stable when compared to the past 15 years, but that's relative, of course, uh, in terms of what Iraq has been through. We still see the security checkpoints all through Baghdad, though traffic is flowing through uh, more freely. Some of the blast walls have been taken down. Most remain in place. There hasn't been a major bomb uh, so far this year, uh, but the security remains tight, and people know this is a fragile piece. They expect more to come. On top of that, you've got the fact there are still millions of people uh, displaced in the country, not all of them in camps, some of them living in the homes of uh, friends and families mm. that have been out speaking to them over the past few days as well. And they said, no, they're not ready to go home. They still believe there's extremist elements in the regions where they come from. And also in many places, they don't have a home to go home to. So all of this is going to take a lot more effort from the government and a lot of money. The Prime Minister says about a hundred billion dollars. All of this so stemming out of, as you say, uh, you know, the period after the US withdrawal when we saw ISIL really emerge onto the scene in that vacuum, uh, also feeding into the divisive politics that we definitely saw in Iraq, not just after the withdrawal of the U.S., but before the withdrawal yes. of the U.S., uh, between various factions funded by regional powers, uh, all of that feeding into ISIL. But now, again, a period of re a relative calm, but a very fragile calm, and looking forward, you know, how to go from here to build some semblance of peace and prosperity. All right. Many of us covered that war 15 years ago. However, how it has been transforming that region and the world is a more than interesting question. The question is the country has been ravaged by the war and transformed into an almost continuous conflict zone. Foreign powers, political parties, why for power at the expense of the Iraqi people? Why the war lead to such chaos? How do the Iraqi people think about this? Yeah, well, initially, you know, many Iraqis, whether they were Shiite or Sunni, welcomed the U.S. troops. They welcomed the toppling of Saddam Hussein. The problem was the U.S. had a military plan and a good one. The, uh, you know, the invasion went better than the generals in the Pentagon expected. The problem was there was no nation-building plan at all, not a shred of it. Uh, so, you know, the military campaign went fantastic. After that, though, it was lawlessness, there was looting, uh, law and order broke down, and there was a political vacuum. Saddam had effectively crushed all of the opposition. The U.S. really did nothing to put a stable interim government in power. And so what you had was inexperienced policies, often with uh, agendas along religious lines, often with funding from the Gulf states or mm. Iran, all pitted against each other, feeding into what became around 2006 a really brutal sectarian conflict. And I really don't know anybody here who didn't lose a family member or a friend in that. They don't know how many people died uh, because okay. so many people remain missing. And really, the, you know, the current situation has fed out of that. Mm. Our own Jack Barton in back, the life for us. Thank you so much, Jack, for being with us. And that is our correspondent Jack Barton reporting from Iraq. Let's get the view from the U.S., the other country that is directly involved in this conflict. My colleague Asya Namdar is there with a man who fought in Iraq for the U.S. Army. That's right, Hanaway. Thank you. I'm joined by Major General Paul Eaton. After three decades of service, he has retired from the U.S. Army. He has served in Germany, Somalia, and Bosnia. He also trained Iraqi troops during Operation Iraqi Freedom. General, welcome to our program. My pleasure. Thank you. So the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq came relatively quickly, but the war lingered for more than a decade. In your opinion, sir, what were the issues? What led to this war dragging on year after year? Well, the siege was set uh, in 2003 when Secretary Rumsfeld and perhaps the president uh, denied post-conflict planning on behalf of our uh, uh, military. So what we had was four star generals complying with that. So phase four, post-conflict, uh, was, uh, was just not addressed. We did not have the right people. We did not have the right planning involved to uh, prepare for the occupation phase. That, the seeds were set in 2003 for everything that happened thereafter. Do you think there was any doubt uh, in the minds of top generals and the military leadership whether or not 
Iraq, in fact, had weapons of mass destruction? Well, we saw Secretary Powell, uh, his great undoing at the United Nations, which I deeply regret, uh, but he believed it. And uh, we had this uh, intelligence system here in the United States that delivered to the United States the specter of weapons of mass destruction. Obviously not borne out. We didn't find any. And uh, so we attacked Iraq on false pretense. Thousands of lives, lives lost, trillions gone, no weapons of mass destruction, General. Do you believe Iraq today is better off than it was 15 years ago? Uh, it's a great question. When I got to Iraq, I uh, found a, uh, a people well-educated, both men and women. I found emancipated uh, women in the universities. They were, they were happy in, in the context that they lived. Uh, life under Saddam was uh, problematic. It was a dictator, a vicious cr uh, creature. Uh, we don't have that in Iraq right now, but we never prepared for the inter-ethnic uh, dramas that, uh, that are still playing out in Iraq. And did the power vacuum created by Saddam Hussein's ouster, the instability, the chaos, do you believe that is exactly what created ISIL? Well, uh, there are a lot of players in the region, and uh, yes, that contributed to uh, the rise of a Sunni challenge to the Shia uh, ownership of the government. But uh, a second order effect was the development of a local hegemon, Iran. And other political actors uh, came in to bear with their own interests. So we failed to accommodate the competing interests in the region. The premise of the war, as we talked about, weapons of mass destruction, how much do you believe that has damaged U.S. credibility in the world? Next time they come up with another intelligence um, you know, disclosure that this country has this and that country has that and we need to go to war here and there. Are people going to believe what top administration officials are going to say? I believe that the American people have learned a serious lesson here and, that, uh, and I believe that that lesson will endure. That uh, America goes to war for vital national interests not conditional interests, not stray uh, intelligence assessments. Uh, we go to war. And everything that I personally do and my colleagues at the Vet Voice Foundation and Vote Vets do is uh, geared to make sure that Congress does its job and constitutionally decides when and where America goes to war. On a personal experience, sir, what was it like to be in Iraq and what was it like to come back? The, my time in Iraq, of course, I was a major general. My, my mission was to create the Iraqi military and uh, from whole cloth. Uh, I loved the job. I loved my fellow Iraqis. I think that uh, the Iraqi population, the people, are amazing. And uh, uh, it was my great privilege to embark on that mission. Coming back to the United States, uh, there was a saying at the time, uh, President Bush sent the army to war, and he sent the American people to Walmart. Uh, the American people have got to get focused. It's okay to say, thank you for your service, but it's better to say, I'm going to make sure that we don't put you on a fool's errand. Is there an image or a memory that will forever stay with you? Something you can talk about, of course. Absolutely. Uh, I woke up the second... Uh, night after, after my second night, I still uh, was getting up at 2 and 3 in the morning because of jet lag and uh, went over to the Republican Palace, ran into a couple of men that I knew from previous uh, uh, operations and uh, asked them what they were up to. And I was in running clothes. And uh, I said, we're waiting for uh, Ambassador Bremer to go on a run. Oh, Bremer. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he shows up, asked me who I was, and I said, sir, I'm your uh, guy to rebuild the Iraqi armed forces. And he said, uh, let's go on a run. And uh, we ran down the dark streets of uh, the Green Zone at that time with two armed men behind us. And uh, 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 Ambassador Bremer's got uh, some serious running capability and some long legs, so I'm going, man, I cannot fall behind on this guy. I, so it was, a, it was a good run. Uh, we kind of bonded at that point. And uh, uh, that was the beginning of my mission. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Paul Eaton, thank you so much.
uh, again, a personal side of the Iraq war and also from someone who was in Iraq training Iraqi troops. Tian Wei? Thank you very much, Asian Namdar in Washington, D.C. for us. You are watching a special edition of World Insight covering the 15th anniversary of the Iraq war. There are a lot of atrocities and tragedies happening in Iraq. We are going to tackle some of those issues after this break. Welcome back. You're watching a special episode of World Insight covering the 15th anniversary of the Iraq War. I'm Tian Wei. This is the 21st century sin in a way. The war left in Iran one of the most important regional players in the Middle East due to the policies of former U.S. President George W. Bush and Barack Obama. The Shia majority in Iraq came to power within the sphere of influence of neighboring Iran. Later, a large number of U.S. military forces left Iraq, leading to the rise of extreme organization like ISIL, which swooped into Iraq and Syria. This has made the regional terrorist threat becoming extremely serious. Take a look at the things happening after that physical war. ISIL emerged from the remnants of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which in turn grew out of the sectarian conflict that followed the U.S.-led invasion in 2003. In 2014, the jihadist group made headlines worldwide as it captured large parts of Iraq and Syria, carrying out regular atrocities, including beheadings and the mass murder of captured Iraqi soldiers. Later that year, the group's leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, stood in a mosque in recently captured Mosul, where he announced the creation of an Islamic State caliphate that pushed as far west as Aleppo in Syria. Two months later, a U.S.-led coalition began airstrikes targeting the group in Iraq, expanding the bombing campaign into Syria the following month. ISIL lost some territory, but more than 8,000 airstrikes over 12 months failed to dislodge the extremist group from its strongholds. All the while, ISIL expanded into other countries, including Libya, while carrying out attacks abroad from the United States and Egypt to France. Two years ago, the tide finally began to turn in Iraq, with the country's special forces recapturing key cities like Tikrit and Fallujah. The final battle for ISIL stronghold Mosul was the world's largest military operation since the U.S.-led invasion. ISIL brought unimaginable misery, but the fight against them also brought a degree of unity to a country that had found itself divided along religious lines. What happened was a great thing and shows how Iraqis are brave and proud of their country. All Sunnis and Shias and the rest inside Iraq, their cooperation has made a great event and we were really proud of it in front of the rest of the world. The challenge now is to build on the unity forged in the fight against the extremist group. The invasion of the Iraq only took about 20 days, and yet the aftermath of that war is still being felt in the region and certainly beyond. For that, we are joined in our Beijing studio, He Wenping, professor at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Welcome to our program. In Baghdad, we invited uh, Dr. Mowafak El Rubai, who is a member of the Iraqi parliament and also Iraq former national security advisor. In Tehran, Iran, we have Professor Mohammed Morandi, a professor and dean of the World Faculty Studies at the University of Tehran. I want to welcome to the three of you. We want to be concise and precise. Ten minutes for the three of you discussion. Let me begin by asking you, Dr. Rubai, that war we covered 20 days only. And yet the aftermath is much beyond the imagination. Tell me about how Iraq has been trying all the years to recover. What have you achieved so far? Well, uh, the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 has achieved one big uh, benefit for Iraqis. That's the ouster of one of the most brutal, ruthless dictatorships in the world. 
but uh, uh, what, what, what followed after that is uh, disasters after disaster after disaster. Uh, the, the, the country was left in total vacuum for several months until we formed uh, a, a, a new government after the 9th of April 2003. Mm. Uh, the, the, that invasion, that the military invasion was named and called at the beginning as a liberation of the country. But after a couple of weeks, uh, the United Nations Security Council resolution called it uh, uh, the occupation of the country uh, and uh, gave the every authority to the occupying forces to do whatever they wanted to do uh, uh, in, the, in the country. Mm. The, the, the country was run for nine years after that by the occupying forces uh, and there were thousands of uh, tactical, operational and strategic uh, mistakes in the economy, in the polit in politics right. and in, uh, in security. And that has created a huge amount of uh, rebound phenomena among the ordinary people, among the resistance, among the uh, also the region. The region was shaken up because the, uh, the, the, the American administration then called two important countries in the region that Syria on our uh, west uh, flank and Iran on our east mm. uh, border, they call them the axis of evil. So these two countries made sure that the American were not subtle uh, in the country and that, uh, that invasion will, uh, will fail. So we won, we won the war, but we lost the peace. Okay, and that's, that's a, that in, is a in, very in important uh, explanation about exactly what happened from your perspective, uh, Dr. Rubai. But the regime change, let's just recount some of the things you just said. Uh, Professor Morandi from Iran, that has set a sad precedence for the region, which did not work at all. In a way, it also reflects the rhetorical power that we have seen that is unbalanced in our world today. Professor Morandi. Absolutely. And I think that uh, when we go back a bit, we, we get clear answers why this all happened. The United States was one of the key players in actually creating the monster that we call Saddam Hussein. They gave him chemical weapons to use against his own people, uh, along with their European allies, against their own people, against the Iranians. The city of Halabche, which is a Kurdish city, almost 7,000 people were killed because of a gas attack. And uh, the United States and the Europeans after that continued to give him chemical weapons. So when we look at this history and the fact that after uh, expelling Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, the people of Iraq rose up against the regime and they were about to overthrow it. And then the Americans actually allowed okay. They, they stopped the no-fly zone and allowed Iraqi regime helicopters to crush the, the rebellion. Mm -hmm. After that, we had the sanctions, and the Americans imposed such harsh sanctions in Iraq that over a million children died. And the U.S. Secretary of State at the time, uh, she said that it, w it was worth it. So this was the mentality of the United States towards the Iraqi people. So this monster that we call Saddam Hussein is a creation of the United States to a large degree. The preservation of that regime was because of the United States. And therefore, the United States, All right. when they wanted to overthrow the regime, it was not because of any benign uh, mentality that existed. That they, is one thing, Professor Morandi. The, the other the thing I want to ask you, because I want you, all of you to be brief today. We only have 10 minutes for the three of you. The other thing is the regime change, as I mentioned earlier in the question. And what kind of precedence is that set for the region? Because we've seen, since then, a string of countries that have run into similar problems. Briefly from you, sir. 20 seconds, if you can. Yes, that, that is a major problem. The United States fabricated... Uh, evidence. We all knew that there were no chemical weapons. We all knew that Saddam Hussein, despite the monster that he was, he had no link to Al-Qaeda or no systematic link. In fact, Al-Qaeda was created by the United States and uh, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and Pakistan against the Soviet Union. So when the United States fabricates evidence, in future, 
that cre not, not only creates huge mistrust towards the U U.S. government, but also we have to be wary that the United States in future, when okay. it attacks Syria based upon trumped up charges of chemical weapons and so on, not that only we shouldn't really trust anything that the United States in, in those regards. After that, there's also regional balance that has existed for decades being broken in a way. You see the rise of Iran, where Professor Morandi exactly comes from, uh, Professor He here in Beijing. You also see uh, the Syria issue. You also see the rise of ISIL, and now the fight against ISIL seems to come to a successful pause, shall we put it that way. How do you see all of these elements as a result of the war in Iraq? Yeah, it's just like a Pandora's box. So when that box has been uh, opened and a lot of uh, disaster evils just coming out one by one. So because this war itself, if we trace back to the war itself, it lost a lot of like uh, just justice. There's no justice. You, uh, you know, didn't give any green light to this war. And all those reasons for, uh, you know, for having this war and proved to be is not existent there. So there's no mass uh, destruction weapon uh, in Iraqi and there's no like those Al Qaeda issue. So this war itself started from the wrong excuse right. and then generated also very bad uh, consequences. And, and Professor Morani, now we are seeing the rise of Iran in the region. Sunni Shia balance, there has been a big debate about that. And also you see regional players rising. Uh, Saudi Arabia and some of the other countries certainly are not necessarily the best friend of Iran. So U.S. is also thinking about withdrawing from the region in a way control the region through quote unquote allies. Uh, Professor Morandi, how do you take that reality briefly? Well, I don't think this is, there's a Sunni Shia issue at all. This is an issue of extremism. It has to do with Wahhabism. Unfortunately, it's the ideology that Saudi Arabia has been exporting which has manifested itself through Al-Qaeda, through the Taliban, through ISIS, and so on. But I think the, uh, the, the real victor here today is the Iraqi people. They, not the United States, they helped themselves by pushing back ISIS, and they are bringing the country together. Mm. And I think the future of, Iraq, of, Iraq, of the Iraqi people is, is a bright future. I, I, the, the country is in shambles. The people are facing hardship. The infrastructure has been destroyed. The Americans helped create ISIS in tr when they tried to overthrow All Syria. Right. We know that through the Defense Intelligence Agency document of the United States in 2012. However, the Iraqi people have really prevailed. And while things don't look good now, I do think that, that we are seeing the beginning of the reemergence of a strong Iraq, a united Iraq, and I think that people are sick and tired of the extremism that has been exported there by okay. groups coming from Saudi Arabia, and I think uh, hopefully Hull. we will have a, bit, a much better future in the years ahead. Well, you might be optimistic about the, the things, and yet things are very complicated. The issue of Syria still has not been resolved well. At the same time, as we mentioned earlier, the conflict possibly among regional players Briefly from you, sir. Oh, yes, I think uh, I'm not so optimistic about uh, the future of the Iraqi. Now, recently, we even uh, heard that uh, there's uh, uh, Kurds uh, even want to declare independence. So, and the Iraqi forces, government forces, have to marching all the way to there. So, there's no, like, uh, pill to mark yet. So, for Iraqi, one is fighting for the territory integrity, and the second is for this uh, rebuilding after all those chaos has been made from that war. Mm. You're watching special episode of World Inside covering the 15th anniversary of the Iraq War. We will discuss the regional and even more important global impact of this conflict after this break. The Iraq War 15 years on, the war has also left a lasting global impact. The toppling of Saddam Hussein led to a vacuum eventually filled by the Islamic State. The rise of the extremist group has affected the global oil supply and security against terrorism in other countries. Take a look. In 2003, many European countries joined most members of the UN Security Council in opposing the US and UK decision to attack Iraq. The past 15 years, multilateral organizations besides the UN helped to discourage unilateralism and the unbridled pursuit of hegemony, some say. The G20, BRICS, and many other multilateral groups are increasingly influencing 
the international community. American unilateralism has needlessly antagonized some of its friends as it withdrew from the international pacts, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Paris Agreement, in an effort to make America great again, a quote from someone. So what did the world learn from the Iraq war? Here is in Beijing, He Wenping once again with us. Meanwhile, we're also joined by Jonah Blank, who is a senior political scientist from RAND Cooperation in the United States. In London, the UK, we have Ian Beck, professorial research fellow at the European Institute of London School of Economics and Political Science. Welcome to the three of you. I want to start with you, uh, Professor Beck, how the war the invasion itself, 20 days only, and the years of wars after that has been transforming the world order even in a way. Yes, so I think we can identify a number of things that have happened. One is that it changed the price dynamics of the oil industry quite fundamentally because what you saw in parallel with the withdrawal of the Iraqi oil supply was the development of new oil resources elsewhere and in particular in the US which has moved from a significant net importer of oil to be a country which is on the, on the cusp of being an exporter of crude oil let alone refined oil products mm. and that is lies behind the US disengagement which is a, a second consequence of the, of the Iraq war we have, in the in interim, we've seen the disappointment of the, the Arab Spring, not really getting anywhere very much. And we have the new security and terror threats, which have in some ways been motivated by uh, the Iraq war. You mentioned in the introduction the, the rise of ISIL. That can be traced directly to the, 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 the demise of Saddam Hussein, who, for all his faults, at least kept a lid on right. that form of uh, uh, terrorism. Now we are seeing, Mr. Blank, the America looking more, much more, shall we say, in, internally than to the rest of the world. Many say it is something that happened after the war in Iraq, a disillusion that the country has, uh, particularly the people in the country has, about the rest of the world. Your say? Yes. I think one of the most important things is to be clear-eyed about the past so that we don't make the same mistakes again. Before the war, America was bitterly divided about the, the wisdom of getting involved, even though many Americans, including Mr. Trump, are on record of having supported the war beforehand. We've got to remember that a majority of the Democratic members of the Congress voted against it. Why does this matter? Because in 2003, the American people were led, I think, in a, a wrong direction mm. that has had very bad consequences for the world, and we now have got to make sure we don't repeat these mistakes. Mm. The trust of government, of course, is a big issue. I remember 15 years ago covering that war uh, from the U.S. Capitol, the, the big debate and the enormous amount of demonstrations going on in the street every day about war or not to have a war. But having said that, though, 15 years already, Ms. He here in Beijing, uh, this is America that has been changing since then. This is also the world since then have been looking at America in a very different way. Ms. He, how is it having an impact on what we are having today when it comes to what order or when it comes to how the world should be run and how the international community should work together? Ms. He. Yeah, uh, for the world uh, order, I think uh, after the end of the Cold War and also even after the end of Second World War, uh, you, with this uh, UN has been established, and then the uh, five principles, those coexistence of those five principles has been written in, in those uh, UN charter to guiding how to keep this world order, uh, how to, you know, protect the countries, no matter it's big or small, strong or weak, and protect their sovereignty. I think those principles has been, you know, unfortunately has been, uh, has been, you know, attacked it. I will not say has been destroyed completely, but has been attacked right. heavily by this Iraqi war. So nowadays, even without any, like, agreement, 
green light coming from the UN, uh, that means the UN authority has been marginalized. And also, we start to even uh, take into consideration of all other big powers' their opinion, like uh, we know the France, uh, like Germany, are also against the war. And the US just go ahead and then to destroy a, a, a regime by the force. Uh, even without finding any evidence they have been uh, saying so. Right. So this is a very bad example. The division among the allies. Uh, the United States looking much more inward, even now saying uh, making America great again or America first. And the rising of different voices, particularly from emerging and developing countries such as China and some of the other countries. Professor Begg, what would all of this mean in a way? How is this, from your perspective, is really shaping the world for the near future? Well, I think it's a, a very fluid position. The Europeans have struggled to adopt a, a coherent position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And it's important to recognize in, in talking about the 15 years since the Iraq war that we had this major economic crisis in, in the developed countries as well, which has shaped opinions. It's, it's led to a, a reluctance on the part of the Europeans to think outside their own borders. We know that Iran has been, if, all, if anything, pretty consistent in its approach. Turkey has become more assertive, so you've seen the rise of a, uh, a new position from, from the Turks. All of this is shaping the Middle East and the wider context. And I would stress yet again the dynamics of that oil industry, which is uh, pulling the economics in a different direction from what we saw as long ago as 15 years ago. Plus, you said you, where you were covering the, the events in Washington then. Don't forget, that was only two years beyond 9-11, or even mm -hmm. 18 months beyond 9-11. Exactly. So, Mr. Blank, here's the thing. You got a lot of the regional changes, the allies of the United States in the Middle East. That seems to have a big impact on what we are having today in that region. You also have the American public getting ever more disillusioned about its own government and the decision made by the government which led to the Obama administration two terms and then people get disillusioned once again and which led to the rise of Donald Trump uh, as an alternative and now look at where we are today. So do you think we can really learn the lesson or things are getting ever worse? Mr. Black. I, I don't think it's a straight line. I think that the Bush administration made a terrible error in going into Iraq, and I think members of both parties, Democrats and Republicans alike, uh, generally accept that now. However, in 2008, the American people elected President Obama, who had opposed the war in Iraq beforehand, and who brought in a very different vision, one that really put America back into the world in an engaged way, treating our allies, our friends with respect and trying to come to, to terms with those who might not necessarily be our friends and allies. Uh, I think that that course could be the course for America again. Mm. Could be. Very interesting, that word. We will could remember be. that. Yeah, we, we got it. And yes. Ms. He also, as the other two guests, one said could be, the other said fluid, the situation. So what's going to be the role for emerging economies. For China, for example, which is now trying to streamline itself when it comes to internal development and its external role. Ms. Ho. Well, I think uh, China's foreign policy uh, has been very clear and they insisted on uh, from the beginning now, even until now. That is, all, you should uh, uh, use all those uh, diplomatic means trying to resolve all those uh, diplomatic issues. And even though uh, if uh, any uh, use of the force were well, necessary to use, we have to go through uh, the UN, uh, get this UN Security Council's permission. So we will respect these uh, international organizations, their authority cannot put the UN at a marginal place. And if all those uh, uh, big powers, they just go ahead with their own wish, that will take the international relation. Those norms, I think, is in danger because those norms have been accumulated, those wisdom from all those countries during the past. Mm. So this is a, a very important thing, lesson we should learn. All right, we only have uh, about uh, two minutes left. I want to have 30 seconds. Uh, thoughts from every one of you, biggest takeaway from this disaster, which has taken more than 15 years, what is it? Let's go to Mr. Blank first. Yes, thank you. 
I think that the, the, the tragedy of the Iraq war is that this was utterly predictable. Anyone looking at the evidence beforehand knew that this was a war of choice and knew that there was not a long-term strategy mm. to put the pieces back together. The real tragedy will be if we in the United States and if the world community don't learn from this error and avoid making similar blunders in the Middle East and elsewhere around the world. Ms. He, 30 seconds for you as well. Yeah, I think the lessons are many too. Uh, one is we should be very careful uh, to use the force. So second is if the uh, force has been used, and they should be very careful to like uh, to dissolve all those uh, existing those powers and, uh, and the authority. So have to put the society in the order and have to take take into consideration all right. of all the local conditions. Mr. Baird, before we go, final words from you, 30 seconds, thank you. Well, the, the first thing to say is that the lesson from the Iraq war is that it wasn't the war itself that was a major problem, it was the failure to anticipate what would happen subsequently. It was a, the reconstruction of Iraq, Iraq was a much bigger failure than the war, which in military terms was a success. Second, I would say that there is a, a legacy of turmoil in the Middle East, which is not going to go away for a long time. And the third is we need to look at the economics of all of this. I mentioned the oil previously. China's role in the Middle East is, a, is an e economic right. power, not really a security or foreign policy power. And China may need to think further on where it goes next. We heard the siren sound in the backdrop, uh, Mr. Uh, Bag. Uh, we can hear the world is still in a place that is urgently need to be addressed, many of the issues, including this war in Iraq, which is based on false allegations. And that is all the time we have for today. Well, I want to thank the three of you for being with us. Uh, he Wenping, Jonah Blank, and Ian Beck. Really appreciate it. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see the Weibo. From me, Tim Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, and our correspondents from all over the world, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.